seven WANs and remote connectivity. Objective is identify a variety of uses for WANs, explain different WAN topologies, including their advantages and disadvantages. There's a lot of similarities between WANs and LANs. You're, you're going to see a lot of the same terminology used. Uh, and in a lot of ways, they are very similar. But there are some subtle differences, and we're going to talk about some of those. Uh, compare the characteristics of WAN technologies, including their switching type, throughput, media, security, and reliability. Also, if you look through the slides, you'll also notice that there's a number of, uh, of errors in the slides. If you go through the book, books, actually, a little bit better job. It looks like they, they uh, proofread the book better than they did the slides. Uh, describe several WAN transmission and connection methods, including public switch telephone network, ISDN, T carriers, etc. Describe multiple methods for remotely connecting to a network. You guys probably played around with some of those, but we'll talk about those and, and maybe some of the ones you haven't. So WAN essentials. A network traversing some distance connecting LAN. So larger in scope, wide area network. We talked about earlier in the semester when we talked about the distinctions between personal area networks, LANs, WANs, LANs, etc. That usually a LAN you have control over the, the LAN between various nodes that you're trying to connect. So if you want to connect two different nodes, you simply lay a wire, you put up a, a wireless access point, and you can establish connectivity that way. In a WAN environment, they're larger in scope. A lot of times you'll have to go to a telecommunications carrier and, and lease lines. Or you might have to go to the city and get approval to, uh, uh, to run a line underground, something of that nature. So WANs are much larger in scope. Um, there's a lot of WAN and LAN uh, uh, properties that are, are common. Client and host resource sharing. You're still trying to connect these devices. You're just trying to do so across a larger, sco uh, larger scope. For the most part, layer 3 and above, LANs and WANs operate exactly the same. HTTP, you're going to see whether you're in a WAN environment or a LAN environment. Uh, TCP IP, you're going to see in both environments as well. Where it really starts to have a distinguishing uh, uh, difference between the two is lower than layer 3. So layer 2 and layer 1. That's where you're going to see some of the differences. Um, most of the time in LAN wiring, it's private wiring. We own the, the, the uh, shielded twisted pair or the unshielded twisted pair or the fiber or whatever in a WAN environment. Most of the time, unless you're the government or a very large telecommunications company, something of that nature, most of the time we're just going to lease those lines. Why? It's cheaper to do it than, than uh, develop our own WAN. So when we talk about WANs, we've got a WAN site and a WAN link. This is an example of a LAN that we've been talking about pretty much for the whole semester. A WAN, a LAN, I should say, if I, if I didn't. A WAN might look something like that. We're talking about really from a much higher perspective. So a WAN site might represent a city, a location within a city. Now that city, Charleston, may have, well, certainly would have a LAN inside of that city. But we want to connect that LAN to a LAN that's operating in New York another land that's operating in Detroit, another land that's operating in Seattle. So each one of those cities represents a, a WAN site, and the links between those represent a WAN link. So the differences between WANs and LANs, the distance covered, the number of users, a WAN environment's going to have a lot more users, uh, the distance traveled. We connect sites via dedicated high-speed links, and we can use a variety of different connectivity devices. Usually in a LAN environment, we use a lot of the same types of equipment over and over again. It just makes sense to do so. But in a WAN environment, a lot of times we have different devices. Why? Because of some of the telecommunication companies that we work with. They each have their own uh, WAN links, and as a result, we have to kind of work with them to be able to connect our, our, uh, our various LANs together. Um, WAN connections require Layer 3 devices in order to be routable, in order to be able to route different um, different packets from one LAN to another LAN. Remember, if you go back, we've got a LAN operating in Charleston, we've got a LAN operating in New York, etc. They don't necessarily have to be using the same uh, the same uh, uh, protocols. So we need to be able to route different uh, different uh, communications back and forth between those. How can we go about physically connecting those different sites? 
a lot of the topologies are exactly the same, so conceptually exactly the same as they are at the land at the land level. So if bus is the simplest one, each site connects up to two sites. Obviously, the sites that are on the end of the, the bus only have one site on one end of them. But all the ones in between have a, have a site uh, on each side, so they connect two sites. So that's similar to land topology. It's different from land topology in the different locations connected to, uh, to another through point-to-point -point links. We're not connecting different nodes, different clients, you know, back to back to back. We're only connecting the sites. So the best use for a, a bus topology is organizations requiring a small WAN, not a lot of clients, or not a lot of sites, I should say. Why? Because it's not scalable. So we might have four different sites that we need to connect in some kind of a bus fashion. What happens if we happen to have a building that's located right here? Well, now we've got to go back to our telecommunications company, and we don't just add another, another location, another link. We actually have to modify this link. We have to get rid of this link. We have to create a link there to, the, to that new site, and we have to create another link there. So it generates quite a bit more work uh, when we have to add. So scalability is not really a big plus. A ring topology, same thing in the land in the LAN environment. It's the same conceptually in the WAN environment. Uh, forms a ring pattern. Differences from a LAN, it connects locations, not individual workstations. Relies on redundant rings in order to make it so that if you have a site failure, you can still continue to communicate. So they don't show the redundancy here, but you might have two rings. In a ring topology, both uh, um, every node or every site is going to be connected to two other sites. So this one has a connectivity to here and connectivity here. If you've got two rings, you've got redundancy. If you've got rings operating in, in the opposite direction, that way if somebody with a backhoe operator or backhoe operator happens to cut one ring, you've got some redundancy built into the network. That's a plus. It also generates additional costs. You're paying for, for twice the network. Um, star topology, same thing with LAN, same general configuration. Single site central, uh, single site central connection point. Separate data routes between any two sites. Advantage is single connection failure affects one location. In other words, if you've got a connection that goes down between one site and the, the central site, the only site that's really affected is that, that one site. All the other sites can continue to function just like they should. So if your T1 right here goes down, these sites can all still continue continue to communicate. Uh, they say shorter data path between any two sites. I don't buy that particular one. Because if you can go back to a ring topology, I mean, this is a direct connection. If, if it had to go through here, that would actually generate an extra, an extra hop. So I don't know that I totally buy that one uh, for a star uh, as an advantage. A drawback, though, is that central site failure. Same issue that we have in a land environment. If you've got a hub that goes down, and the hub goes down in a, in a star configuration, any help? I'm so sorry. I thought that them driving has no project. That's okay. That's Fine. So no problem. Um, so the same advantage in, in this topology as far as a WAN. If your central site goes down for some reason, it can't process data for whatever reason, the entire WAN goes down. So that's a big problem. One of the ways to kind of address that is through, the, through a mesh topology. And a mesh topology is great if you've got the money. If you've got highly critical uh, um, uh, needs for connectivity, a mesh may be a good way to go, but it's very expensive. Uh, you end up with a lot of directly connected sites, and there's a couple of different types. There's full mesh versus partial mesh. In a full mesh, every site is connected to every other site. That's fine for a small network. That doesn't get too expensive, especially when you start to remember you're leasing telecommunication lines from AT&T or Verizon or, or whoever it may be. But as you start to add sites to, to your network, to your WAN, now all of a sudden that gets really, really expensive. So most of the time you end up with some sort of a partial mesh, in which case only the sites that are really important, the ones that really need to have connectivity to them, uh, have the redundant links. So you might see a full mesh like that. You can see just with four different sites, you end up with one, two, three, four, five, six different links. As you add more sites, that, that number grows really quickly. Versus a partial mesh over here, you end up with these three that are all connected. 
this one in Indianapolis is probably a little less important. Why? Probably guess because it only has one one land line. Another approach uh, is a tiered approach, which logically makes more sense. It's very easy to kind of think about and kind of lay out your your WAN in this configuration. Uh, sites connected in star ring formations interconnected at different levels. Um, it really becomes an issue of planning ahead of time very carefully because what will happen is growth ends up occurring and changes in usage, usage patterns and your structure changes drastically. Now they put the wrong graphic in here in the, in the slides. If you look at the book there's a better graphic, but it looks more like a tree structure. Um, and you can see if you look at that, uh, I guess I got off. If you look at it in the book, you might have like four main sites, maybe New York and St. Louis and Chicago and Los Angeles or something like that. And then based on that, you might have other smaller sites down from each one of those. So it's a logical way to kind of kind of break up your, your WAN. Now the downside to that is what happens is over here, let's say this is San Diego, uh, what happens if over here all of a sudden you have a big boom and now all of a sudden you have to hire a bunch more people. You know, put a lot more devices showing up over here. So the growth in your network becomes a little bit of an issue of being able to manage that and anticipate that. How do you make sure you don't end up with too many users on one particular, in one particular part of your WAN? because that affects your WAN performance. So, if we've designed all our various, uh, once we've designed our WAN the way we want to, we've kind of got a, the topology laid out, what are the specific technologies that we're going to use to be able to deliver data from point A to point B, or from site to site? Um, public switch telephone network, we're not going to use, but the book wants to talk about it, so we will just, just briefly. Um, some people refer to it as POTS, plain old telephone service, dial-up network. I mean, you use a, a, a modem, dial into the network, and gain access that way. Um, originally, analog traffic. Uh, today, in a lot of cases, it's digital traffic. Uh, ISDN, for example, uses, uses digital. Um, the dial-up connection, used very early on, the modem connects to a computer to a distant network for a finite period of time. In other words, once you turn on your computer, you're not connected. You do whatever it is you need to do. When you need access to the network, your dial-up networking software comes up, dials a number. If you have any logon information, you might have to enter it at that point, or it may already be filled in for you. Uh, makes the connection. You download the file. You upload the file, whatever it is you need to do. And when you're done, you disconnect from the network. Your computer continues to run. So it, it's, it's not an always-on connection like you see with DSL or cable modems or things of that nature. Public switch telephone network elements cannot handle digital transmission requires a modem. Remember, computer talks in ones and zeros, but the traditional telephone network operates as not, operates as analog. So a modem modulates and demodulates that signal, converts those ones and zeros into analog signals that can be transmitted across the plain old telephone system. Signals travel between between modems over the carrier's network. In a lot of cases. The telephone company converts those back to digital signals. Why? Any guesses? It's more efficient switching. It's more efficient. They can compress digital data, it's, so it's much faster. Uh, they can correct for errors. There's all types of advantages to, to transmitting in, in digital. So, in a lot of cases, they'll convert it back to digital, transmit it to wherever they need to transmit it, uh, and, and go from there. So, an example there here at the home. You dial in to your local CO uh, using a modem. They're going to convert it back to uh, convert it back to digital, and then go through the rest of the transmission process in digital. In some cases, you'll hear uh, a term referred to as the local loop or the last mile. That's the connection between your local CO, the central office, the closest CO, usually you know three four miles from from your location or closer to your actual house or facility that you're operating in. That's referred, as the, referred to as the last mile, so if you hear that, that's all they're talking about. The vast majority of the time, that connection is going to be copper cable. At least, uh, I should take that back. That depends on where you're located. In Stephenville, it's probably going to be copper. In, 
Dallas-Fort Worth, it may be fiber optic. They're, they're, you're seeing a lot more fiber to the home uh, in metropolitan areas. Um, another term you'll hear uh, periodically is the uh, demarcation point or the point of demarcation. That's this part right here connected to the building. When the phone company's line comes up to your building, it'll go into some kind of a box. Their responsibility is up to that point of demarcation, up to that box. Outside of that box and into the house or into the business or whatever is your responsibility as a homeowner or whoever owns that particular building. Uh, so it's the local loop endpoint. Carrier's responsibility ends at that point. Um, let's see, the advantages to, to using dial-up or public switch telephone network, everybody has a telephone jack, right? I mean, really, almost throughout the world, there's telephone jacks. So the cost, ubiquity, it's everywhere. Uh, disadvantage, some circuit switching is used and marginal security. They talk about marginal security, it's not an always-on connection. Remember, we talked about when you need access to the network, you dial into the server. That means you're only susceptible while you're connected. So if you spend most of your time working on a Word document, there's no need to be connected. You're not, not really much at much risk. Um, it's only marginal, though, because anybody outside of your house can plug up to your telephone wire and listen to the ones and zeros go across your data, or go across the line. So the, the security is kind of marginal. It is a little bit better, probably, than an always-on connection. I would probably argue that it's quite a bit better because, you know, it's just from my perspective, I think it is. Uh, but the book kind of makes a case for it being maybe a little bit better, but not a lot, than an always-on connection. Uh, another approach, X.25 and frame relay. You're not going to see a lot of these in use anymore either, except they're really kind of more uh, legacy approaches. Uh, but you may occasionally run into, into one of them. Uh, they're very similar. Difference being X.25 uses is analog, uses packet switching, versus um, frame relay is digital. Other than that, they're really very similar. Um, X.25, mid 70s, uh, really pretty slow, versus in 92 there was an updated uh, version of it. Throughput increased significantly, but obviously by today's standards, 2 meg is, is really pretty slow. Um, allows you to connect clients and servers across the internet just like we, we do today. One of the things that helps to slow it down is it verifies transmission with every, uh, every, at every node. So that means it excellent, has excellent flow control and ensures data reliability. That creates a lot of overhead. Overhead reduces the efficiency of the transmission. So you slow and unreliable for time sensitive applications like you know, audio, video, stuff like that. Frame relay, frame relay is digital, so it's a little bit different than X.25 in that, in that respect. Uh, operates at the data link layer. Um, both of them can perform error checking. The difference is, is X.25 can correct for it. Frame relay relies on other layers to correct for it, which isn't a problem because TCP takes care of that, right? We have a packet that doesn't show up or shows up damaged. TCP says, hey, wait a minute, I didn't get that retransmitted. So it gets handled with another layer. But this just ends up generating some additional overhead. Down here, they have a typo. This actually should be frame relay. Frame relay. The throughput of frame relay, 64 bits up to 45 megabits. Much more competitive with what we might uh, uh, be interested in, in today. The advantage of that is it allows you to kind of choose the level of access that you want, the speed that you want. You're going to pay for what you get. Want to pay more, you get more. Um, both use virtual circuits based on potentially disparate physical links, logically appear direct. The advantage of that is efficient bandwidth use. It's a virtual circuit, not a real, a, a real physical circuit. What does that mean? That means the telecommunic telecommunications companies are putting other people's data on the wire along with yours. So that means that physical circuit is being utilized more efficiently. Both are configurable as SVCs, switched virtual circuits, where a connection is established for the transmission and then terminated when complete, similar to what you might see in dial-up networking, or PVCs, permanent virtual circuits, uh, where a connection is established before transmission and stays after, tra after transmission. PVCs are probably more appropriate when you have consistent data needs. So you might have a very consistent data flow that's, that doesn't change much. You can end up with 
establish a PVC and have, have a little bit better quality of service. Uh, PVCs are not dedicated individual lengths. Again, they're virtual circuits. Um, with both of them, uh, X.25 Warframe Relay, lease contact, you, you uh, create a contract to lease that transmission line. You specify the endpoints and the bandwidth. You know the two sites that you have to connect, right? You've got an office in New York and Philadelphia or wherever it happens to be. So you specify those endpoints. You specify the bandwidth. How much bandwidth can you afford or how much do you need? And then based on that, they're going to give you some kind of a committed information rate. How much, you know, they're going to guarantee that you get this, this, this particular speed. Um, like I said earlier, shared bandwidth with other X.25 frame relay users. That's why it's a relatively efficient uh, uh, use of the, the, uh, the lines. A relay, a frame relay lease advantage, pay for the bandwidth required, and it's less expensive than some of your other uh, uh, other WAN technologies. It's a worldwide standard, so there's regardless of where you are throughout the world, for the most part, you have uh, uh, companies or, or telecommunication companies that can provide frame relay access. So that's a big advantage if you're operating in, say, the United States and India. Uh, frame relay and X.25 disadvantage, throughput variability due to shared lines. You're sharing access with other companies, other individuals that might be using that same, those same physical lines. What happens when they get really busy? Well, that means they tie up more bandwidth. That's less bandwidth for you. So that's a downside to it. Uh, frame relay and X.25 easily upgraded. Uh, upgradable to T carrier dedicated lines, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Same connectivity equipment for the most part. So you might see there's kind of an example of uh, organization connected via frame re relay. ISDN. ISDN's been around a long time, and it used to be a something that was really kind of reserved for professionals. A lot of doctors, lawyers type uh, uh, individuals would use ISDN because it was relative to dial-up, high-end, but it wasn't as expensive as, say, some of the T-services. So it was something that you'd see a lot in, in those types of applications. Um, digital transmission, digitally transmitted data across public switch telephone networks. Ever, anybody ever heard of an ISDN modem? It's not technically a modem. Is it modifying the signal? Yes. It's actually operating at the data link layer. Um, but it's not converting from digital to analog or analog to digital. Um, so it's actually uh, uh, transmitting digital data across the public switch telephone network. Really started to grow in the in the 80s. I believe it actually started back in the in the 90s. I believe it actually started back in the 80s, but it really wasn't very widely adopted. And then by the time it really started to take hold, you started to see advances in some of the other technologies. So you don't see a lot of ISDN. Uh, in use anymore. Um, one of the advantage, advantages of ISDN is it allows you to simultane simultaneously carry both, both uh, data signals as well as voice signals. So it's similar to DSL in that respect. Protocols at the physical data link and transport layers allow uh, uh, specify for signaling, framing, connection setup, determination, flow control, error detection, all that kind of stuff. So ISDN really does take over a lot of the different layers of the OSI model relies on the uh, telephone system for transmission. And it comes in a couple of different flavors, dial-up versus dedicated uh, connections. Dial-up relies exclusively on digital transmission. Now, there's, like I said, there's several different flavors or several different perspectives of looking at ISDN. Single line has simultaneously, uh, you can have two voice calls and one data connection. And it does this because it has two channel types. Uh, B channels, which are referred to as bearers, circuit switching for voice, video, and audio clips of 64K, and then a single D channel, uh, which is, is for data, packet switching for call information 16 or 64 bits. Of those, you've got BRI and PRI, basic rate interface connection and a primary rate interface connection. So with BRI, remember you've got those 2B plus D, you've got those two B channels and a single D channel. Those two B channels are treated as separate connections and they can keep carry voice and data. You can bond those two together and instead of 64-bit, 
Now you end up with 128 kilobit. So you can end up with significantly faster speed. It doesn't sound like a lot of speed by today's standards, but when you're talking about 4T4 modems, that was pretty fast. Uh, PRI is, uses 23B channels and a single 64 uh, kilobit D channel. Obviously a lot faster. Uh, separate B channels independently carry voice data. Maximum through point, throughput of 1.54 megabits per second, so a lot faster. And they're compatible between the two, PRI and BRI. Now, most people have heard of T1 connections, right? T1s, T3s, etc. Um, there's T1s, there's fractional T1s, there's T3s, and there's a, a number of other ones. But the T1s, fra fractionals, and, and T3s are probably the most common. And it really refers to a, the physical layer of, of transmitting, uh, transmitting our data. Single, uh, a single channel is divided into multiple channels using time division multiplexing. The medium that gets used, depending on the T level that we're operating at, is either regular telephone wires, so twisted pair, fiber optic, or, or some type of wireless link, microwave, for example. The telephone wire or twisted pair really only operates at the T1 level and, and below. Uh, it, it, when you start getting into the faster ones, you have to go to fiber optic ultimately. Uh, so there's kind of some comparisons. A fractional T1 uh, number of channels is 1 and 0 0.064 megabits per second, so it's not a lot. Um, a, T, a single T1 is 24 channels, and that gives you the 1.54. And what you'll notice is that you've got a, a DS1C here, or a T1C. T2 is not twice as what a T1 is. It's four times. Same thing for a T3. It's a lot more. So it's not simply a, a multiple, uh, uh, simply multiplying it by whatever the T3 is, T2, etc. So it's, it's something you kind of have to keep an eye on. I'm not going to ask you for specific numbers, but I do want you to kind of know that T3 is, has more channels and as a result is much faster than, say, a T2 or a T1. Uh, types of T carriers. T1 is 24 voice channels or data channels. You combine all 24 of those together to get 1.54 megabit. T3 provides 672 voice or data channels, so a lot more. You can get up to about 45 megabits per, uh, megabits per second. The T carrier speed is dependent on, a, on the signal level, the physical layer, layer electrical signal, signaling characteristics. And those signaling characteristics are Described, I guess, is probably the best way to put it, by DS levels, so digital signal level 0, 1, etc. So, T1 uh, use connects to branch offices, connects to carrier, and it's good for telephone companies, COs, and ISPs, smaller ISPs. It's a very fast connection. For the most part, individuals aren't going to have T1 connections, small businesses aren't going to have T1 connections. They cost too much. But for smaller offices, or, or for, for larger small offices, I guess, and smaller medium-sized offices, uh, you might see uh, uh, the use of T1s. T3 appropriate for data-intensive businesses. They require a lot more speed, a lot more uh, bandwidth. T3 provides 28 times more throughput. More throughput equals more money. Uh, in a lot of cases, what you'll see is you'll see businesses purchase access to multiple T1 connections. Why? It's cheaper than access to a T3 line. Uh, T1 costs vary by region, so just because you operate in one area of the country doesn't mean that it's going to be the same cost structure in, the, in a different part of the country. Uh, in a lot of cases, for smaller businesses, fractional T1s make sense. Rather than using all those channels, uh, maybe just use, say, 12 channels. Uh, so you have a fractional T1. It's going to cost less that way. So you still can have some of the advantages of a faster connection, but not have to pay for it. Um, some of the hardware that, that uh, is required at the customer site and the switching facility, you've got to have equipment. You can either purchase it or lease it, and you usually can't use it with other WAN transmission methods. It's, it's going to work on the, the T-carrier lines. T-carrier lines require different media and throughput dependent. So what are some of those wirings? Well, plain old telephone wire, so shielded twisted pair or unshielded twisted pair. Remember from land, from talking about lands, and a lot of times what we're talking about the speed affects how much data we can send. The more, or, or 
uh, uh, affects how much interference we can, we can deal with. If we're sending a lot of data really fast, we can't really afford to have a lot of interference. We're sending a lot of data really fast in this type of environment, so most of the time you're going to prefer shield and twisted pair to kind of protect yourself. If you don't, you're drastically going to reduce the distance with which you can, can communicate. Uh, T1s using shield and twisted pair require a repeater over 6,000 feet. So in a lot of cases, twisted pair is probably not the best approach. Uh, multiple T1s, uh, if you're going to have more than one, say multiple T1s or, or move up to T3, etc. Uh, coax cable, microwave fiber optics, so no twisted pair. And then once you get up to T3, you've got to go microwave or, or fiber optic. Some of the devices that are required, a smart jack, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you a networking diagram here in just a second that hopefully kind of, of uh, make it a little bit more explanatory. But a smart jack is a, is a, a place to terminate the T-carrier wire pair. So they come off the wire wherever they come, uh, and they come into to a smart jack. And that's what allows you to start to connect your local network, your local building, to their network. In a lot of cases, it's inside or outside the building. Anybody have fiber optic in their house or... It's similar to that. A lot of times they'll show up uh, and, and they'll put a special box on the side of your, your house, sometimes on the inside of your house, and the fiber runs up to that. Outside of that, you run copper inside your local facility. But So it's very similar in that, in that respect. Uh, in addition, you'll have a CSU slash DSU device. They're actually two separate devices, but in a lot of cases they're combined together. Um, it's a, it acts as a T1, uh, T1 line connection point at the customer site. The CSU side of things provides digital signal termination and ensures connection integrity. The DSU side converts T carrier frames into frames that the LAN can interpret. Why is that important? Well, most of the time our LANs are going to be running on Ethernet, maybe token ring. This is going to provide that translation between the two. So. You might see something like that. You end up with your smart jack that's connected to the telecommunications network. It goes up to their telephone poles, however that, however they're actually transmitting their, their data. That, that's on the side of your house. This is inside, maybe in your networking closet, uh, something of that nature. And then it's connected to your terminal equipment. Terminal equipment, so your routers, your switches, hubs, etc. Um, which is what all that's saying right there. In a lot of cases, the CSU, DSU equipment may be integrated with a, a router or a switch, um, which is good in the sense that it, it makes things easier to configure. Uh, in a lot of cases, because they're all combined, the additional cost for that device is less than the cost of the individual devices if you added them up. So a lot of times it's cheaper and maintenance is a little bit easier. So you might see a, a, something like that, which is really probably more what you might see in a lot of, of networks. So you have your local network connected via a switch, connected to a router with the CSU DSU built into it, and that's connected to the smart jack. So there's, it, as far as the actual design of the network, it's really not all that complicated. The DSL is similar to what an ISDN, uh, uh, to ISDN in the sense that it's still digital data going across the network. So. When they say DSL modems, it's not technically a modem. Uh, it's more, acts, really acts more like a bridge. Uh, operates over public switch telephone network. Competes with ISDN T1 services, and they didn't put it here, but actually uh, cable, uh, cable services as well. Requires repeaters for long distances. One of the disadvantages to DSL, you have to be within a certain distance of CO, or you're not going to have access. You're not going to be able to get adequate service. Um, how many people are on DSL? Everybody on cable? Okay. One DSL? Cable? Dial up? Cellular. Cellular? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, best suited for WAN local loop, meaning nice and close to the facilities. Uh, so you have to be within that, you know, two, three, four mile range of the CO. Uh, supports multiple data and voice channels over a single line. Um, basically, it works by separating the frequencies that your cable will be receiving on your, your telephone line. The telephone lines uh, capable of delivering a variety of frequencies. The lower frequencies it reserves for voice communications. 
high fre range frequencies, which are usually higher than what we can hear on, on, uh, uh, across the telephone lines, are reserved for data. That's why sometimes you'll see, depending on the specific uh, DSL that you happen to be using, you'll see line filters applied and things like that to try to make sure that that separation is occurring. Uh, uses advanced data modulation techniques, um, etc. So there's a, like I said a second ago, there's several different flavors of DSL. There's probably uh, there's probably two or three that are really common, and then other than that, there's probably seven, eight, nine that are are fairly common. Uh, usually, when you see an X, it's just kind of a generic term that says you know we're not going to specify which specific flavor we're talking about. This is kind of common to all the different flavors of DSL. Uh, some of the common ones, ADSL and GLight, probably the most common. GLight is not really a, a whereas a, ADSL actually means something, asynchronous DSL. GLight doesn't really stand for anything per se. It's a marketing term. It's where you had several telecommunication companies that came together and decided we needed to create a, create a term that we could market to users. So that when they heard GLight, they knew what it meant. It's kind of like what Intel did with their processors when they started naming them uh, um, Pentiums instead of the 686 or 386, 486, etc. cetera. Uh, you can't trademark 686 because that referred to its architecture. You can trademark Intel uh, um, any. Uh, two DSL categories, general categories, asymmetrical and symmetrical. Whenever you see this terminology, asymmetrical and symmetrical, there is some characteristic about whatever that happens to be that is the same and different. The same is denoted by symmetrical. So you see S, think same, asymmetrical, whatever characteristic that happens to be, that's different. So that's how you kind of keep that straight. And you'll see that used in a variety of different uh, uh, um, aspects with respect to computing. As it, uh, uh, as it relates to transmissions, when we talk about asymmetrical, we're talking about upstream versus downstream being different. And it makes sense to have have different speeds. Why? Because most of the time we're downloading information. If you request a web page, you type in www.microsoft.com, that's a very small request. There's not a lot of data in that. All you're really providing is that address, just you know, some text, not very much. In return, you're getting back a web page that has a lot of graphics to it, various links, maybe video, maybe audio, so you can receive back a lot more data than what you actually transmit. So it makes a lot more sense to have faster download speeds than you have upload speeds for consumers most of the time. There's obviously there's, there's exceptions to that. But. So that's what they're talking about when they say asymmetrical versus symmetrical uh, there. Um, asymmetrical, more throughput in one direction. It's usually downstream rather than upstream, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, appropriate when video conferencing or web surfing, most of the time you want to make sure you're downloading stuff faster than your upload and stuff. Symmetrical, equal capacity for upstream and downstream. And then they give you some examples, HDSL, SDSL, etc. Best for uploading, downloading significant amounts of data. So if you're going to be publishing a lot of stuff, if you're going to be uploading, say you create a lot of videos and you're, you're uploading them to YouTube or something like that, you may want to have symmetrical uh, DSL or something like, something like that. So then they kind of give you a comparison of some of the different types of SDSL and their distance limitations, et cetera. So how do they, these, these different, uh, different types of DSL differ? Basically, in their data modulation techniques, their capacity, distance limitations, and the public's uh, PSTN use. So there's an example of a DSL modem. And like I said, it's not really a modem per se. Uh, it really acts more as, as a, uh, not a gateway, but a, bridge between two different networks. By the way, just kind of as a side note, don't use Netgear. I have nothing but problems with Netgear, but maybe you've had good luck, but not, not, not me. Uh, ADSL is a common example of home computer, uh, on a home computer. That's most of the time what you're going to see, either that or G-Lite. The vast majority of the time, if you're on DSL, that's what you're going to be using. Um, so it works like most networking devices. You've got to establish some type of TCP connection and you're going to connect or transmit through that, that DSL modem. Most of the time, that DSL modem is going to be an external device. It's going to be similar. It's going to, might look 
similar to a, a, a router, and in some cases it, it has router uh, capabilities to it. They do actually have internal ones as well, but those are pretty rare. You're not going to see them very often. Um, like I said earlier, you might have, depending on the specific flavor of DSL that you're using, a lot of cases you'll have a splitter that separates the voice from the digital data. Um, in some cases, certain telephone systems don't play real well with those high frequencies that uh, the data is transmitted on, so those, those uh, splitters become important. Uh, the DSL a lot of times is connected to a switch or to a router, really to provide internet access or network access to a wide variety of, uh, of computers on your network. Rather than just having one computer connected to it, you want to connect all of them, you want to use a, a switch or a router. Let's see. Um, ADSL continued. DSL modem forwards modulated signal to the local loop. Signal continues over the four pair UTP wire. That actually depends on which type of DSL is being used. Normal telephone wires, you only use, even though they use four, uh, four wires to pair, there's really only two wires that are actually being used. And in some cases, those extra two wires are never even hooked up. So it depends on the type of DSL that you're actually using, whether or not it actually uses all four wires. Uh, distance less than 18,000 feet, the signal is combined with other modulated signals in the telephone switch. This is an important characteristic that we'll come back to here in just a little bit. It, it, it relates to an argument between DSL versus cable. So we'll come back to that here in just a second. Uh, at the carrier's remote switching facility, the splitter separates the data signal from voice signals. The request is sent to the DSLAM, uh, which acts as a DSL uh, multiplexer. And a request is issued for the carrier's network to the internet backbone. So you might see something like this. You get your local network here, your regular telephone, and your, your computer goes into a DSL modem. It goes to the splitter. At this point, we're not thinking anything about telephone communications after this point. We're only thinking about data. It goes to the splitter, and all this is being sent to the carrier's facilities up here, along with your neighbors and his neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just your signal. It's your signal and everybody else's. This is similar to what you see in, 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 in a cable infrastructure, which we'll see here in just a second. And that I want to come back to that to kind of talk to you about some of those differences. Uh, main competitors for DSL, T1 carriers, ISDN. Um, not really. Uh, really, probably the biggest one would be cable. It's probably the biggest competitor. Uh, as far as DSL installation, you need, you, you need hardware. You need a DSL modem. And then you've got your monthly access costs. As far as costs, slightly less than ISDN. And now I'd say they're probably quite a bit less than ISDN and a lot less than, than T1 connections. DSL drawbacks, not available in all areas. Why? Because they're not COs everywhere. You've got to be within a certain distance of those COs. And when you start to get into rural areas, you're just not going to, not going to be close enough to be able to, to, to have DSL access. You tend to see DSL used an awful lot in businesses. Why? Because it's relatively cheap. Their biggest competitor is cable modems, and most businesses don't have cable run to their businesses, or at least not they're not as ubiquitous as telephone uh, jacks are. So as a result, you end up with a lot of businesses using DSL, a lot of individuals using cable because they a lot of times already have cable access and cable uh, for the televisions. Um, so broadband cable, that's the real competitor to DSL. Cable companies connectivity option based on TV signals, coaxial cable wiring. Theoretical transmission rate, really quite good. Real transmission rates, it's not quite as good, but when you, you know, really who cares as long as you're satisfied with your service, you're, you're happy. Um, a, lot of a lot of times the transmission is, is throttled. Why? Because it's a shared communication medium. Well, so is DSL. The difference is the level at which they're shared. In the, in the next uh, slide or two, I'll, I'll talk to you why that's important. So if they have shared physical connections. Best use for cable uh, cable connections, web surfing, and network uh, data downloads. So there's an example of a broadband cable modem. Again, same thing as the DSL modem. It's not really uh, modulating and demodulating the signal per se. Um, Operates at the physical and data link layer may connect to a connectivity device such as a, a router to provide access to the rest of the network. Um, infrastructure required HFC, hybrid fiber coax. This is really doesn't have anything to do with you as an individual. 
has to do with the cable companies. When cable was originally designed, it wasn't designed for transmissions to go back to the cable company, was it? They're just sending out cable signals to customers. So it's really a one-way communications uh, uh, idea behind it. So the cable companies really had to invest a lot in their infrastructure to be able to provide that, that communications backwards as well. And that's what they're talking about here, this hybrid fiber coax, the ability cabling that would, would allow them to transmit in both directions. Uh, individual cable drops, so cable drops at your house or, or your facility to be able to, to connect your devices. And one of the big advantages, like DSL or T1 connections, provides that dedicated connection, that always-on connection. It's a security risk that you're always on, but it's a real convenience as well that you fire up the computer, you're on. Whenever you, you hit the browser, you're on. And so uh, the downside is, is if you walk away from the computer, you're still on. So it's a security issue. Uh, many subscribers share the same local line, and as a result, they share the same throughput. Well, they share the same throughput on DSL as well. That's been a big complaint from the cable company. The DSL uh, uh, proponents advocate for DSL that you don't share your communication line with, with uh, other subscribers that you're around. And that's true relative to cable you know, for this, this local line. The argument, though, has really been centered around uh, service, how fast. So on a cable line, if this guy down here is using a lot of, of bandwidth, that takes away bandwidth from all these other users. Well, if you go back to that, that other line, that, that other uh, diagram for DSL, the same thing's happening. It's just happening at a different layer. It's happening inside the telephone company where they're sharing that bandwidth. As the, the telephone company separates the voice from the data, then they combine the data from all the different users. What's not really being talked about is the fact that this is a security concern. When it comes to DSL, very rarely you're going to have to worry about somebody breaking into the phone company and listening to data going across the wire. Can that happen? Yes. Is it likely? Not so much. But in this environment, what happens if this person, who, you know, new person moves in and they're less than scrupulous? Uh, they lack scruples. That's a problem because they can listen to everything that's going on because it's not occurring higher up inside the cable company. So it is, to me, the issue is not so much about sharing bandwidth because you're doing that on DSL and cable. The issue is it really relates to security. So uh, for the most part, as long as you keep your system patched and updated and the sites that you deal with banks, for example, are encrypting their data, which most of them are, uh, it's not a big deal. If somebody listens in, all they're getting are random ones and zeros. Uh, but it's something you want to be aware of. Don't send email with critical information because email is not encrypted. So if you send social security numbers in email and somebody's listening in, they've got your social security number. ATM is another approach. Uh, function of the data link layer, it's something that's really kind of being phased out. Uh, because this book doesn't really talk about it. Um, the, one, um, the one WAN technology that they leave out of the book is Ethernet. We talk about Ethernet at the local area network level, but not at the WAN level. And you're starting to see strides to push Ethernet at the WAN, environment, at, at the WAN level as well. And a lot of the reason that ATM is kind of fading to the, to the uh, into the background is because of Ethernet at the WAN level. Uh, operates at the data link layer like Ethernet. Asynchronous communication method, meaning the way it sets up communications are different. It doesn't constantly send out message after message after message. It's not timed like that. It sends out a message when it needs to send it out. That means that there has to be a structure to that message that says, hey, this is the beginning of a message. There has to be another structure at the end of the message that says this is the end of it, so it's complete. Other than that, the data, the, the network's just sitting there. So that's what it's talking about right here when it says nodes do not conform to predetermined schemes specified in data transmission timing. So each character is transmitted using start and stop bits. So information that says this is the beginning of the transmission and information that says this is the end of it. Um, fixed packet sizes sets ATM apart from Ethernet, so it's a little bit different. And the packet, or they, in ATM speak, they refer to them as cells. 
48 data bytes plus a 5 bit uh, uh, 5 byte header. That's a lot smaller than an Ethernet frame. It makes up for that in speed. Remember we talked about before, ideally we have what? Larger payload. Larger payload means it's a more efficient transmission. Less header information relative to how much actual data we're sending. ATM has a relatively small payload capability, but it's very fast. So as a result, it's able to overcome that additional uh, additional um, uh, header information. ATM relies on virtual circuits. It's considered a packet switching technology. Use of virtual circuits provides circuit switching advantage, though. You know, in other words, it provides re it, it's very reliable, uh, provided a point to point connection. So the network connection is perceived via the virtual circuit as a point-to-point -point connection, uh, which it, it means it in, ends up producing a very reliable connection. Also allows you to specify quality of service levels, which makes it very good for things like video, delivering video, because you can specify the importance of one frame, if you will, over another type of frame. Compatibility. Um, very compatible with other uh, networking technologies. Cell support multiple higher layer protocols. So it's separate of TCP IP. If you want to run TCP, TCP IP, which are higher layer protocols, across a, an ATM network, you can do that. You don't have to use Ethernet. You can use ATM. Uh, it does this through LAN emulation, L-A-N-E, which allows integration with Ethernet, token ring, all those various uh, um, protocols that operate at, at layer two. It does that by encapsulating those Ethernet or token ring, ring frames into a, a cell that ATM understands. And then on the receiving side, it, it strips that back out. The throughput, very fast, 25 megabits up to 622 megabits. So relative to most WAN connections, that's very fast. Um, I think my parents' business, they were getting with five or 25 meg. So ATM is really, really pretty good. Uh, cost, it's relatively expensive. ATM costs a lot more than what my parents are paying for, for 25 meg. Sonnet is the, the last one I think that the book talks about. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. Strengths of it, WAN technology integration. It's compatible with a lot of other uh, um, um, protocols. Fast data transfer rates. Simple link to link additions, in other words, it's easy to add a link or take away a link depending on, on your needs, and a high degree of fault tolerance. Um, it uses synchronous transmission. Data is transmitted and received by nodes, conforms to the timing scheme. What does that mean? That means less header information. So that's more efficient as far as, as, as each individual transmission. It also means that you spend a lot of time transmitting stuff in you know, blank frames. Why? because of that timing that's occurring. You're always in communication, whether or not you're sending anything or not. The advantage is interoperability. So when you look at a Sonnet configuration, it might look something like that. So advantages of, of Sonnet, fault tolerant. Why? Because of double ring topology over fiber optic. One of those nodes is going to be the telecommunications company. Um, and they don't actually show that there, but in, in real life it would be. Um, a sonnet ring begins and ends at a telecommunications carrier's facility. They have control over over that, that, that ring. Uh, connects organizations multiple WAN sites in a ring fashion. Connect with multiple carrier facilities. That extra ring provides additional fault tolerance. So that's a, a big plus. The cost is the downside. You pay for for that fault tolerance, you're paying for it. Terminates at a multiplexer, easy sonnet, ring, connection, additions, removals, etc. So that's kind of like more of a logical uh, perspective of it. It's a ring uh, approach, so you're going to see an incoming ring for ring one and an outgoing ring for ring one. So it's going to go out, go to your various facilities, wherever they might be, and then come back. So it's a, it's a ring topology. The data rates are similar to what you might see with a T connection, uh, only they use an OC level. So OC1, OC, OC3, OC12, etc., and the data rates that you actually see. Again, the same thing with, with the T connections. 
I'm not that worried about the specific speeds and you knowing those. I do want you to know that obviously an OC12 is faster than an OC3. Implementation for Sonnet, it's really expensive. That means mom and pop stores, individuals, they're not going to have a Sonnet connection. But for large companies, it, 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 it might, might make sense. Long distance companies, it's kind of their thing. They, it's kind of their what they need, so that they absolutely need. Large ISPs, they might have Sonnet connections. Uh, and then some of the local telephone companies, large telephone companies. And the reason it's kind of limited to those groups, again, it's that expense. So there's kind of a comparison of the different WAN technologies. Uh, Dial-up over public switch telephone network, X.25, frame week, relay, etc. All the way down to DSL, cable, ATM, and SOM that we've, we've talked about. And it really talks about the, the uh, kind of compares them based on the media that they're using. To twist the pair, shield to twist the pair, uh, microwave, uh, coax cable, etc. And then it talks about their speed, some of the speed differences. And it really is kind of in order as much as it can be uh, with respect to that 56K down to 40 gig. So. The chapter finishes up talking about remote connectivity. Anybody use remote desktop? Anybody else? Most of you? Um, then there's also VNC, um, which is a, another type of remote desktop uh, software, very similar. Been around longer, it's open source. Um, Remote access ser uh, service allowing client connection login capability to a LAN or WAN in a different geographical location. So you're at the office, you want to access your home machine. If you know the right address and your, system, your machine is configured for it, you can access it and it's like you're sitting in front of it. So for every now and then you might run into an application that doesn't play nicely. But for the most part, you can do just about anything from that remote location. That's really cool as long as it's you doing it and it's not a hacker that's doing it. Um, Requires a remote client to access files, applications, and shared resources. So printers, you can you know, redirect prints and things like that. Sound, those types of things. A remote access communication requirement. You have a client, a host, man, a host transmission path, some kind of network connectivity. And appropriate software, remote desktop, for example, with, with uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Windows. And depending on your network connectivity, dial networking, uh, RAS or RRAS, virtual private networks, etc. Dial-up networking, you might dial directly into a private network or an ISP in order to gain access to the network. Um, and you can usually gain access through a variety of transmission methods, either you know, through dial-up, uh, X.25, ISDN, DSL, cable, etc. It doesn't depend on, on the specific transmission method because it's an application layer protocol. Uh, advantages, technology is well understood. Stood is, did I go back to before? Okay. Um, dial-up networking, dialing directly into private networks. This is one we just talked about. Uh, advantages of dial-up networking, technology is well understood, software availability. It's built into most operating systems. You have dial-up networking built in. Uh, disadvantages, throughput. It's very slow. Uh, quality. It's not uncommon to have a lot of noise on your telephone lines. It just it, it happens. That noise ends up being being converted into transmission errors, and as a result, retransmitting damaged uh, damaged data that reduces your throughput as well. And administrative uh, maintenance. So once upon a time, this was a a the predominant approach, at least for consumers. Anymore, that's not necessarily the case. As a result, people just aren't as familiar with it as they once were. Um, as far as some of the Microsoft software, they have a remote access service and they have routing and remote access service. I believe RAS is the older one. RRAS, I think, came out with uh, Windows Server 2003 uh, and is in uh, 2008 as well. And it provides you the ability to dial into the server and access your, your, uh, your network remotely. Uh, remote access servers, some of the server requirements, they accept a client connection to grant privileges to the network's resources. What does that mean? That means they have to have the ability to authenticate you as a user. You really are who you say you are. Then once they've authenticated you, they have to be able to authorize you 
to the three resources that you're supposed to have authorization for. So you really do have the right to print that file or delete that file or create a file in that particular directory, things like that. Uh, a couple of different approaches. In some cases, you have dedicated devices that, that you're, you dial into and they want to grant you access. Uh, it usually provides you a little bit better performance. Another approach is to use a computer with installed software, such as RRAS. The performance in some cases is not usually as good with that approach, but in a lot of cases, the, the feature set that you have, the ability to log, uh, to have them log into the network at certain hours or uh, attached to certain devices, you usually have a lot more control with this, with this approach. But they don't, don't tend to perform as well because as a full-fledged operating system, you're usually doing a lot of other functions as well. Microsoft Remote Access uh, Software, RRAS, computer accepts multiple remote client connections, the server acts as a router, and multiple, it has multiple security provisions. So, anybody seen um, Virtual World that we have? Anybody played with that? Anybody had Mr. Deer in it before? No. You, may, you probably will at some point. Um, they have a website that you can basically go to where they create virtual clients and you log in and you've got an entire operating system to play with. He sets up multiple clients, uh, usually a, a server, a couple of different clients that you can access that server to and you can play around with, with your network. Um, it's, it's something that they, they want all of us to do. It's not stable enough for me to, to commit to it just yet. But that's kind of an example that really allows you to completely run an operating system remotely through a web browser, and that's all you're, all you're really doing. So an example of accessing a remote access server, you might dial up through the public switch telephone network to a remote access server. That remote access server authenticates you and says you really are who you say you are, all those uh, authorizations, you get all that. Then you have access to the corporate network. File and print server, the web server, to the database. You can access everything that you need to remotely by logging in through that remote access server. Remote access protocols, SLIP and point-to-point -point protocol. SLIP is an older uh, uh, older protocol. It doesn't tend to get used as much uh, anymore because it's not um, particularly easy to work with, uh, easy to set up. Uh, it also only supports TCP, uh, or excuse me, IP rather than, than some of the other protocols that operate at that layer. Not usually a big deal anymore but, you know, there's a time when IPX, SPX, and the Bell world was very big. So, um, SLIP kind of went by the wayside. Point-to-point -point protocol tends to get used much more uh, these days. Automatic setup, performs error correction, data compression, etc., and supports asynchronous and synchronous transmission. So, you can see that point-to-point -point protocol kind of operates there at the data link layer, really kind of in between there. point-to-point -point over Ethernet. There's also remote virtual computing, which is what I was just talking about a second ago with, with virtual world. Um, computer client controls computer host or server across a network connection, you know, some type of dedicated WAN link. The host allows client access. You want to have that. It's essentially a security measure. Why? Because you don't just allow anybody access to your system. You want to make sure that they're allowed to. A lot of times that's done by restricting it to access to a specific computer or requiring some kind of authentication uh, via a password. It operates as a thin client. What does that mean? It means you're only using a web browser. The advantage to that is you're not sending a lot of data back and forth from your remote computer or from your local computer to the remote computer that you're accessing. That's important because if you were sending all that data back and forth and doing the processing in your local computer, that ties up ties up a lot of bandwidth. Remote virtual computing really operates on more of a thin client approach. All you get is a lot of screenshots. All that processing is being done on that remote computer. So the advantage is, is simple configuration. It runs on any connection type. Um, remote vir virtual computing software, some of the differences, capabilities, security mechanisms, and supported platforms. And examples are remote desktop, DNC, and Citrix's ICA. Remote desktops built into um, um, Microsoft uh, Windows. Uh, it was built in in XP. Uh, it's 
that's built in and Vista, et cetera. Uh, it's not available on their home editions, so it's not something you're going to see on the home editions. And all, all their other ones, they are. They have clients that you can install on Linux boxes, for example, so you can actually be running a different operating system and still use Microsoft Remote Desktop. VNC is an open source version, uh, so it's free. Uh, personally, I don't particularly care for it. I, I've run it before. Uh, it has issues with respect to screen resolution, and the screen refresh rate is not quite as good. Um, so as a result, sometimes it appears choppy and things like that. Um, so Remote Desktop, Windows Client Server Operating System, relies on RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol. It's an application layer protocol, so again, it doesn't really matter about all those other protocols that you're running. It's an application layer protocol. All those other protocols will, will work with it as well. Uh, it uses TCP IP to transmit graphics, text quickly. Carries session, licensing, encryption information. Why is that important? When you're logging into this remote computer. You're sending login information to that remote computer. You've got to encrypt that, so that, that's, that's uh, important. And like I said, it has clients for other operating systems, and it's not including included on, on their home editions. Um, you have to enable it, so if you go to System Properties and then on, on remote the Remote tab, you've got a couple of options. You've got Remote Assistant and you've got Remote Desktop. Both of those are useful for letting other people access your system. You might enable Remote Desktop so that when you're off somewhere, on vacation or at work or something like that, you want access to your home computer. As long as it's on, you, you should be able to log in. You have to have the address information, but you can log into it. You might enable remote assistance if you happen to have a friend that's a computer expert. You want to allow remote access, you can create, um, you, you enable that, and then you can actually create an email that allows you to send a packet to them that gives them access to your, your computer. And that way they can look at your screen, see what's going on. You can see what they're doing at the same time. They just take control of the computer for a period of time. You can take back control at any time, so it's not uh, something you really have to be really worried about. Once you run uh, Remote Desktop, you're going to see something like that, and you have to type in the address. If you've got an IP address, uh, you can type in the IP, uh, IP address in there directly. If you've got a DNS address, uh, a domain name, you can type that in directly there as well. So whichever one you want. VNC is an open source version that does exactly the same thing. Uh, it's just a, a, an open source version. Protocols also operate at the application layer. Um, multiple computer platform operations, the same software will run on Linux, runs on Windows, etc. Um, drawback is screen refresh rate. It just doesn't look as good. It's not as clean. It's not as tightly integrated with Windows. Uh, so I, I really like remote desktop myself. Uh, Citrix has a version that does some of the very same stuff. It's a very good product. It's done a lot uh, with respect to presentations a lot of times. Companies, organizations that are trying to sell you demos and, and things like that, they'll invite you to a webinar and they'll take control of your computer and they can show you a lot of stuff. Um, so it's some very nice software. It tends to be expensive though, so it's, it's not something that you're going to see at the home level or small business level. You will see it more at the corporate level, um, and it's a very nice, nice software package. Relatively easy to use, uh, very uh, uh, compatible with, with most systems, but it is does tend to be expensive and difficult to configure. And then I think the last uh, section of this chapter talks about virtual private networks. Virtual private networks, everybody heard of VPNs? You know basically what they are? It's a way to use the public internet as a private WAN. WANs are expensive. Sonets, I mean, using Sonet uh, um, uh, links or you know, ISDN or all those various transmission uh, um, options that we talked about earlier, that gets expensive. Access to the internet, though, is relatively cheap. We can use VPNs to create a virtual private network across that public network and achieve a lot of the same results for a lot less money. And that's the, the real appeal of VPNs. Uh, so isolated from other, uh, other public line traffic. Software, in a lot of cases, is inexpensive or built into the operating systems. Uh, tailored to the customer's distance and bandwidth needs. Two important design considerations are interoperability and security. Obviously, if you're sending personal information, private information, across a public uh, connection, security is an issue. You, you, you worry about that. How does, uh, 
How does it work? Basically, it does it through a process called tunneling, creating a tunnel. Tunneling is a process ensuring VPN carries all the data, uh, data types privately by creating that tunnel, which is a virtual connection between two, two VPN nodes. So Los Angeles creates this tunnel across the internet to send it to Detroit. What's that tunnel made of? A tunnel is made of one of two protocols that encrypts that data, encrypts that information. <clears throat> and the two competing standards are uh, PT PPTP and LT L2TP. So point-to-point -point tunneling protocol and layer two tunneling protocol. Microsoft is the one that really pushed point-to-point uh, -point tunneling protocol. Um, it's probably not quite as popular as it once was. It kind of jumped out there and was was uh, uh, kind of the one that really people jumped on board at first. Then you had a number of different um, companies that came together, including Cisco, to help develop the layer two tunneling protocol. And it's much more interoperable uh, from different pieces of hardware and software. Uh, as a result, it's probably the, the protocol that people prefer. And the way it actually creates that, that private network, if you will, is it encrypts that data so that anybody that happens to be listening in, all they're going to see are those jumbled up ones and zeros. They don't mean anything uh, unless you know how to un uh, unencrypt them. An advantage to layer two tunneling protocol over point to point is it's very flexible as well. You can connect two different routers that, that are compatible uh, across the network. So they automatically have a VPN connection between those two. You can create a, v, a, a VPN between an individual client and a remote router. Um, you can create a VPN between a client in one LAN network on one side of, of the state or the country or whatever, and a client inside a LAN on, in another network somewhere else. So it's very flexible about how you want to go about creating your VPN. Um, so this chapter, we talk about WAN topologies. A lot of the same terminology that you see in the LAN environment, even though a lot of it's very similar, when you're thinking about WANs, keep in mind we're talking about sites that are being connected, not individual clients that are being connected. So that's one of the real distinctions. We talked about uh, public switch telephone networks and dial-up considerations, and really a lot of these other, other different types of transmission uh, approaches as well. A lot of those are older. You're not going to see them anymore. Um, ISDN, for example, really the focus probably should be on DSL, cable, uh, T1s, Sonnet, etc. Um, a lot of those operate at layers one, layers two uh, of the OSI model, so they're very interoperable with the upper upper layers. So they operate on the internet and they're a, uh, capable of carrying internet uh, uh, information. Chapter finished up talking about remote connectivity, remote virtual computing, and, and VPNs. So, um, any questions about?